What happens to us when we die? We might not want to think about it, but it is essential that we do. The Bible teaches it, and we're going to ask what the Bible says about the soul. Is it an immortal soul? If it's not an immortal soul, what does happen at death? And what is the hope that the Bible offers us through the Lord Jesus Christ of life beyond the grave? We believe the Bible is the word of God. We believe this is the place we, we should come to test out any idea that we might have in our heads about the truth of these things. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2 with the creation of the first person, the first man, Adam, and see what it says there. So it's in Genesis chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 7. I'm going to put it up on the, on the screen there just uh, to analyze it a little bit more carefully. But if you want to look at it in context, have a look at it in Genesis chapter 2. God is uh, giving us an account now of the creation uh, in chapter 1 of Genesis is the creation of the heavens and the earth and all the animals and plants in it. And in chapter 2, focuses down on the creation of mankind. And in verse 7, we're told that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Well, that's the statement of how God created us. Can we believe it? Well, we are dust. Chemists will tell us that if our bodies were boiled down to the basics, we were mainly water, aren't we? But if, if you took the water away and, and the rest was uh, uh, a chemical, what would it be? Well, it would be the same chemicals of carbon and, uh, and so on that you'd find in the soil. So it's absolutely right. We're not anything other than an organization of the material world that God has created, except for, verse 7, that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, those words, you know, breath and life, they're just ordinary words. There's nothing supernatural in its uh, existence. It's not talking about an immortal spark. It's the breath of life. The air we breathe enables us to be alive. And man became a living soul. So just notice that, that the word for soul there, the living soul, isn't something that was added into the mixture by God. Here was a, 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 an ape man, and God put a soul into it to make it into a human being. That's not the way it was. The living being is the soul. In fact, you find then, if you, if you do a little bit of homework, which uh, all of us can do with a concordance, and you look there at the Hebrew word for soul, no, certainly not an immortal screen. So, uh, the Hebrew word for soul is nephesh, right? And, you know, just reading what the concordance uh, lexicon tells us, a breathing creature. It, it's a word that can apply to an animal uh, or to a human being. Right? And it's translated soul 475 times and life 117 times and person 29 times. Uh, in Old English, uh, the word soul did mean a person. You know, when a, a, in those tragic occasions when a ship sank, and they'd say, all souls were lost. It's a word for a living person. Uh, they're no longer living people. Uh, they are drowned. So soul is the word for a living creature. That's what it is. It doesn't have a mystical sense. It doesn't have the idea of immortality, quite the opposite. When Adam sinned in chapter 3, and God says, well, I told you that you were going to die if you sinned, and you have sinned, so you are going to die. The description of death in chapter 3, verse 19, is very interesting. It's quite a long passage, but the, the verse that focuses down on our particular subject is verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. 
For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now that's pretty straightforward, I would suggest. Right? There's, there's nothing there about anything immortal going on. You've been made out of the dust of the earth, and God has breathed into you the, the breath of life. And what's going to happen is the opposite. That breath of life is going to be taken from you. And what is going to go back to the dust? Well, you say, well, the body goes back to the dust. But notice it says, dust you are, and unto dust you will return. Right? It's you, Adam, who's going to return to the dust. You're not going to be anywhere else. Your conscience existence isn't going to float off somewhere else. You will return to the dust. Now, that's pretty fundamental. That's how he was created, and that's how he was going to die. There's a verse in Genesis 7, verse 22, uh, when the flood destroyed the world of Noah. And we're told about the, the death of, of creatures then. It says, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. And for those uh, younger ones interested in, in chasing up some of these things, if you go to the parallel Bible, which you can easily do online, You'll see that is there's a word in the Hebrew that hasn't been translated in Genesis 7, verse 22. So the phrase, the breath of life, the Hebrew reads in the opposite direction. Right? You have to start over on the, on the right for the Hebrew. It says, everything that had the breath of the spirit of life in its nostrils died. You've got to be quick to catch, catch up with me, haven't you? Everything that had the breath of the spirit of life died, right? So the, this breath of life is sometimes called the breath of the spirit of life. And I think what it's telling us is that life comes from God, the power of life, the power to be alive. It's not just oxygen, as I've said, and it might uh, upset some, but, you know, as a, as a medic, I, uh, I've seen people die and I've seen dead bodies. And you know that even if you put them on a ventilator after they died, you won't bring them back to life just with pumping air into them, right? You know that. There is something else. There's, there's a power that God has given to create life. And, you know, biologists can't really define that life-giving power. It's not just the sum total of chemical reactions. There seems to be something more to it. But it's not a conscious existence. Adam doesn't go anywhere except back to the, to the dust of the earth where he came from. Right? The spirit of life, the breath of the spirit of life. It's a way of talking about life is a gift from God uh, and it is sustained through us breathing and that defines us as breathing creatures, as living souls. But when you go to Job chapter 34, as I'm going to do now, <coughs> one, of, uh, one of many passages we could turn to, when I go to Job chapter 34, you can see the idea of this breath and spirit actually coming together in a very interesting passage. So Job chapter 34 verse 14 says this, that if God should set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, you know, it's it almost like synonyms, aren't they? If he gathered unto him his spirit and his breath, the power of life, God gives life to all the creatures of the world. Life comes from God. Right? A bacteria is alive. The life of the bacteria has come from God. We're not talking about conscious existence. We're talking about the power of God to create life. If he gathered unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish. And then what will happen to all flesh? What will happen to people? Well, they turn again to the dust. So, when you just look at the passages which talk about creation and death, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, you'll see there that it is pretty stark, you might think pretty brutal, the facts are very, very clear. 
that the Hebrew scriptures are telling us that death is the cessation of life, that a living soul is a living being, and that when that living soul dies, they're a dead being, right? In fact, there is, there is a verse in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 14, which is, which is quite a startling verse. If you did believe in the immortal soul, then you'd have a real problem with Ezekiel because it says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So rather than thinking of souls as immortal, you know, it cannot be destroyed, it actually says it will die. So this is, this is what the Psalms tell us, for example, Psalm 6 verse 5, in death there is no remembrance. There's nothing, there's nothing to be able to remember because the life of the person is gone and the body is returning to the dust. Verse 3 of Psalm 146, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. So the dead person is not a thinking person. They're not able, in verse 5 of, chapter, of Psalm 6, they're not able to give God thanks. So many people believe that the dead may be somewhere wonderful in the presence of God. But they can't give God thanks. And they have no thoughts. And Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 5 says, The living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty brutal, isn't it? There's no hope then, is there? Well, well, yes, there is, and it's a pretty straightforward thing. If you come to the book of Daniel, uh, I haven't, sorry, I haven't got the page number, somebody wants to shout it out, but uh, it's up there, I'm not going to do any more in Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, uh, this is a prophecy of the end time. This is a prophecy of the end of human history when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to to the earth to set up God's kingdom. Uh, this is the time that we're looking at at the moment when we look at the Middle East and we see the extraordinary things that are going on there. Uh, and chapter 12 of Daniel, uh, verse 1, talks about the children of thy people. It's talking about the Jews in verse 1. And it says in chapter 12, verse 1, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was. So this is a prophecy which is looking at a world of trouble to do with the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. And that's the time that the resurrection of the dead takes place. So look at verse 2. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now there's the hope. There's the wonderful promise. And this is something that you see not just in this passage, but it's a fundamental feature. Abraham, the great patriarch of the Jewish nation, Patriarch of the Arab nation as well, was told by God to offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And Abram was willing to do it. He was willing to offer up his son. Not that we're told that human sacrifice is good, but God was testing him. Offer up your son. And Abram was willing to do it. And the New Testament says, why was he willing to do it? Because Abram believed in the resurrection. Abram believed in the resurrection. Way back in Genesis, chapter 22, Abram believed in the resurrection. So it's not as if some add-on point has been given. It's always been the case that God says, when you're dead, you are dead, but I can make you alive again. And chapter 12 of Genesis, uh, Daniel says, and that will happen when Christ comes back. Many of them, not all, but many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Now, what do you awake from? You awake from sleep. And verse 2 describes the dead 
were in the dust of the earth as sleeping. Well, of course, that's, that's a figure of speech, isn't it? I mean, what it's saying is that a person has died, they've ceased to be, they've got no thoughts, they can't remember, they can't praise God, but it's just like a sleep because God can bring them back to life again. The closest analogy I can come, uh, and you might experience this, is having a general anesthetic. You know, when you have a general anesthetic, you're asleep in the deepest way possible, aren't you? Your, your brain is shut down. Uh, and when you go off to sleep, you know, it's quite nice, really. They give you chemicals to make it feel quite nice. And they say, and they're talking to you, and then you're gone. And, and you know nothing. You know nothing. Until somebody's saying, wake up, Stephen, wake up, wake up. <laughs> Come on, wake up. And, and you know you've been in a deep, how much time has passed, you don't know. Well, for Abram, it's going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But he's going to wake up. God will, look, if God can create Adam in the first place, he can recreate Adam in the second place. If God can raise the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, he can raise us from the dead. That's the hope of the gospel. They are dead. The Bible concept is that those who are going to be raised from the dead are sleeping in the grave. And you know, that's a wonderful thing because well, people who believe in the immortal soul, I can see my screen great. I don't know about yours, but mine, mine's great. People who are sleeping in the, uh, uh, people who believe in the immortal soul, sorry, let me get back on track. People who are believe in the immortal soul, what happens to that soul? You've got to send them somewhere. Right? If you've got an immortal soul, look, if some people have, everybody has, because, uh, you know, it can't just be some people with an immortal soul and, and lots of people without an immortal soul. If, if somebody's got it, we've all got to have it, don't we? It's got to be a basic feature. What happens to those souls? Oh, you say, well, they'll go to heaven. Everybody, everybody will go to heaven, will they? Will Hitler go to heaven? Is that where Hitler is now in heaven? You know, is, is, is that where Stalin is? Is he in heaven? Pol Pot, is he in heaven? They must have immortal souls. If, if somebody's got an immortal soul, they've got to have them as well. Well, that doesn't seem right, does it? And so, well, no, they're, they're somewhere else. Well, well, where are they then? Or well, they've been punished. Forever and ever and ever. Okay, the really bad guys, they deserve it. What about the ordinary guy then? The ordinary guy who hasn't accepted the gospel, is he going to be punished forever and ever and ever? You see, the problem you get into with making up things that are not in the Bible. But here we have that the dead are really dead, that God will raise some, many, from the grave and give them eternal life if they have been faithful, and others will be sent back to the grave. Now, you know, that's not our particular subject, but it's whether we have this immortal soul. And my answer is the Hebrew scriptures know nothing of an immortal soul. Now, some people say, oh, yeah, but that, that's Old Testament. In the New Testament, it talks about it. No, it doesn't. It doesn't talk about it. I remember a friend of uh, mine many years ago in Huntingdon on a campaign uh, impressed me because he had a five-pound note and he was waving the five-pound note and he's saying to anybody, I'll give you this five-pound note if you can show me the immortal soul in the Bible. Right? And of course, he kept his five-pound note because it's not there. It's not there. Um, if we did have an immortal soul, why wouldn't God tell his people Israel about it? Why wouldn't he tell Moses? Why wouldn't he tell Abraham? Why would he be talking about resurrection rather than what's the soul going to do at death? It would be a very surprising thing if when we turned the pages of the New Testament, we found that there was... Um, an immortal soul. By the way, in the time of the New Testament, people did believe in an immortal soul. Not because the Bible taught it, but because the Greek philosophers had enormous influence in the way people thought about life. 
And I find these uh, quotes useful because they actually explain, well, why do people think they have an immortal soul? And I ask, it's not because the Bible taught, teaches it. It's because Greek philosophy was so influential. This is Encyclopedia Britannica. The idea of the soul as a mental entity with intellectual and moral qualities derives in Western thought from the Bible. No, 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 not from the Bible. Derives in Western thought from Plato and entered into Judaism during approximately the last century before the common era and thence into Christianity. Now, what they're saying is that Judaism, you know, after the whole Testament scriptures were completed, the Jews started to get some wrong ideas from the Greeks, and that's how it came into Christianity. It didn't come through the Bible. That'd be really strange if the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching Plato rather than Moses. Do you think that would be really odd, wouldn't it? What would be going on? Why don't we just go and study Plato then? Why study the Bible? In Jewish and Christian thinking, it has existed in tension with the idea of the resurrection. Surely it is in tension with the idea of the resurrection. And what happens in modern day funerals is that the, the priest or, or the vicar or whatever will use resurrection passages for an immortal soul going to heaven. Right? They'll mix up two different things. They'll, they'll, they'll conflate two concepts. Well, it's in the Bible, it talks about resurrection. Resurrection is resurrection, is a dead person coming back to life. Jesus stood in front of the tomb where Lazarus, his friend, was buried, and he called Lazarus out of the tomb, and the man came out of the tomb, bound hand and foot in his grave clothes. That's resurrection. When the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, they went to look for the body, it was gone. Turned behind it, there he was. Right? It's not going to heaven as an immortal spirit or soul. It is actually the physical resurrection from the dead. The Jewish encyclopedia. The belief that the soul continues in existence after the dissolution of the body is a matter of philosophical or theological speculation rather than of simple faith, and accordingly nowhere expressly taught in Holy Scripture. That's what the Jewish encyclopedia says. It's not there. The belief in the immortality of the soul came to the Jews from contact with Greek thought, chiefly through philosophy of Plato, its principal exponent, who has led to it through Orphic and Eleusian mysteries, in which Babylonian and Egyptian views were strangely blended. The idea of the immortal soul was a feature of those religions and cultures that Israel were told to get away from, to have nothing to do with, not to adopt their thinking and their practices. And this one might surprise you, it's the New Catholic Encyclopedia. The Christian concept of a spiritual soul created by God and infused into the body at conception to make man a living whole is the fruit of a long development in Christian philosophy. In other words, it's not taught in the Bible, is it? That's one way of saying it. It, was a lot, it took us 300 years to work this one out. Something as fundamental of what happens to us when we die took 300 years to work out. Right? Only with Oregon in the East and Augustine in the West was the soul established. Can you imagine the power to establish the soul as a spiritual substance? Amazing power in those two people. And look at this. It says then, Augustine's doctrine owed much to Neoplatonism. So all three encyclopedias agree. The idea of the immortal soul did not arise from the Bible, it arose from Greek philosophy. And do you know that Greek philosophy is actually mentioned in the Bible many times? The Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians, they're only up the road from Athens, the center of Greek philosophy. 
They were wannabes. They wanted to be like Athens. They wanted to be intellectual philosophers. And the Apostle Paul says, the wisdom of the Greeks, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The Apostle Paul, when he spoke to the philosophers of Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, he talked about the kingdom of God on earth, that God has given assurance to all men that he has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Resurrection is the thing. So just look at this link now. I think this is really good because it, it, it really binds together Old Testament, Hebrew Testament teaching and the New Testament, the gospel record. See, John chapter 5, if you look at those two passages, I hope you can see them. Uh, don't blink and it'll go. Um, if you look at verse 2 of Daniel chapter 12, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 28, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Jesus is quoting Daniel chapter 12. Isn't that important? Jesus is quoting. Jesus says nothing about immortal souls. And so we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because this was our reading, because it is so fundamental, so immensely important. Some in Corinth were thinking, perhaps influenced by this Greek Plato, that human beings have an immortal soul, which at the moment of death floats off somewhere, uh, and therefore the resurrection of the body is unnecessary. Maybe that was some of the influences around them and they were responding to. And they were denying that there was actually a resurrection or it, it, it happened in the past and that's done and dusted. So verse 12 of chapter 15, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection? Now, look at this, it's really important. If there is no resurrection, he says, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, your preaching is vain. Your faith is also vain. Right. Verse 16, if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. That's absolutely fundamental, categorically rules out an immortal soul. Because, you know, there's no space between any verse to insert the idea of an immortal soul. He says, if there's no resurrection, then Christ isn't raised from the dead. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, it's all over. Finish. Forget it. Christianity is a fake. Walk away. Do something else. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you're going to die, and that's the end of it. Because if Christ is not raised, if there's no hope of resurrection, we're perished. If there was an immortal soul, the Apostle Paul couldn't have said that. Could he? It, it's clear and obvious that if Christ is not raised from the dead, then Christ is still dead. He's not in heaven either. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Boy, you water people. So think about that. Think about that passage. <coughs> Notice that he describes the dead as asleep because they're going to be raised but if they're not going to be raised they're not asleep they're perished God. Oh. when people sort of at the time of uh, the reformation 
started to read their Bibles and move away from Catholic doctrine and say, well, I can't find immortal souls in the Bible. You know, people from the time of William Tyndale started to have the Bible in English. So that some of them, they, you know, if they read their Bibles in English, they say, well, where's the Trinity? You can't find that. Where's the immortal soul? Can't find that. <coughs> so a name was given to people like William Tyndale. Uh, it said, they called the doctrine soul sleep. Soul sleep. That's okay. You live with that because people are sleeping in the grave because they're going to be raised from the dead. And, you know, William Tyndale, who gave us, essentially, it was much to his credit that we have the Bible, was burnt at the stake. He strangled first as a token of mercy towards him, but his body was burnt at the stake for the terrible crime he committed for speaking out about what the Bible said. And this is what he said in uh, arguing against Thomas More. And you, or ye, in putting the departed souls in heaven, hell, and purgatory, destroy the arguments wherewith Christ and Paul prove the resurrection. And again, if the souls be in heaven, tell me where they be not as good a case as the angels be. And then what cause is there of the resurrection? I mean, it's a tremendous argument, isn't it? So if the departed souls are in heaven, what point the resurrection? If they're in fellowship bliss with God, what are you doing bringing them back to go into a dead body? He says, he doesn't say, like I've been saying, it's not in the Bible. He says, right, it destroys the argument of the Bible. That's powerful. It's not just, it's not in the Bible. The concept destroys the truth of what is in the Bible. So that's, that's uh, uh, by the way, uh, John Wycliffe, who translated the Bible from Latin into Middle English, which most of us would never be able to read, but they could. In those days, John Wycliffe, just like Tyndall before him, seems to have uh, believed in soul sleep in the same way. So it's not just some, you know, strange people called Christadelphians who, who hold this belief, you know, some people who don't really know what they're talking about. Some of the great figures who brought the Bible to us into our language realized what the Bible said and didn't say. That's, that's the way it is. And, and just ask you now, in the last... Uh, little section here. So, okay, okay, so you say it's not in the Bible. You say resurrection is uh, the answer. What about those passages then that people say shows about the immortal soul? So, let's have a look at them. Uh, Alan this morning in his, uh, his exhortation this morning took us to Luke chapter 16 and spoke about that. And in Luke chapter 16, you've got a parable of uh, two people who have died, a rich man and a poor man. And in their, in their death state, they're in somewhere called Abram's bosom, and they can see each other. And uh, one is burning and the other is not. And there's, there's a conversation going on. Uh, okay. And if you're worried about the rich man and Lazarus, then... Uh, you think, oh, I should take this as a literal account, it would be against everything else that we've been showing the Bible says. But what Alan told us this morning, if you remember, was it was one of the parables of Luke. It's a parable, right? It's not a literal case. And it seems that Jesus is taking hold of some of these Greek ideas that had infected Jewish thinking, these ideas from Plato, which had started them thinking along lines uh, and turns it against them. Because the whole point about this parable 
It's about resurrection. The rich man who is in torment says, go and tell my brothers, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to be good people because spare them from this. And the answer is, even if somebody rose from the dead and went to tell them, they wouldn't listen. You see? Even if it, resurrection is the point, it's, it's, it's a parable talking about the fact that when Jesus would rise from the dead, the Jewish leaders will not even believe then that he was who he said he was. Now, it's not an easy parable, I agree, uh, but it's also a parable that you can't take literally. What sort of heaven would it be if instead of looking out at the beauties of well, uh, the new world, you were watching the torture of wicked people forever and ever and ever. Nobody takes this literally, not even those who believe in the supernatural immortal soul. I'll put those thoughts before you. The other passage is Luke chapter 23, and this one is often brought up, you see, because the thief on the cross is crucified next to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are two thieves, one either side of the Lord, and they start off uh, joining in the, uh, the condemnation and the ridicule of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But over time, one of them has second thoughts, and he comes to realize his error and realize who Jesus is. And he says to him in verse 43 of Luke 23, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And that is in, uh, in, in answer to the question of verse uh, 42. He says to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So notice, what this uh, man is asking Jesus to do is to remember him right, when he comes at some time in the future into his kingdom. This man understood the kingdom of God on earth was at some future date when Christ returns. This man knew the gospel. Obviously, he was a thief and he'd obviously fallen away in his behavior. But now he realizes that Jesus is actually going to forgive him. Jesus says unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So the question is, what did Jesus mean? Because that day, verily I say unto thee, today, that day, Jesus was going to be in the grave. He was going to be in the tomb for three days and three nights. Is he saying to the thief, you're going to be with me in the tomb? Well, that's not a very hopeful message. But Jesus called the tomb paradise. That doesn't make sense either. Now, people think we're cheating when we give you the actual answer. Right? Uh, uh, but if you're serious to look at this, so in, in, the, in the Greek New Testament, there, there aren't commas, right? There aren't commas. Uh, the punctuation is an English uh, thing. And if you took the comma away from the second line of verse 43, right, you obviously could read this two different ways. Verily I say unto thee, this is the King James Version, pause, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, it didn't come true because that day Jesus wasn't in paradise. That day Jesus is in the grave. So could you read it a different way? Yes. Verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, when I come again to set up the kingdom, you will be raised from the dead and you will be with me. Is that a valid way of reading it? Well, actually, verily I say unto thee today is a very uh, Hebrew way of expressing the emphasis on, look, here and now I'm telling you straight. And you could go back to the book of Deuteronomy to see examples of that. So I put that to you. You might think I'm ducking and diving. I don't think I am. I think it's an absolutely valid uh, point. Verily, I say to thee today, you will be with me 
in paradise. Now, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, you say, well, what about that? And there may be other verses, and please do come and, uh, you know, try and shoot us down with them, and we'll see what these verses mean. But these are the ones I can think of uh, have been uh, put to me in the past. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus is telling his disciples that they're going to go out after the resurrection. They're going to preach to different parts of the world, and they're going to find themselves in opposition by... Uh, uh, put, put uh, in trouble by opposition. They're going to be jailed. Some of them are going to be beaten up. Some of them are going to be killed. And he says, don't worry. I will uh, be with you. The, the angels will be with you. Don't fear them. Verse 28, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Well, there we are then. You can't kill the soul. Oh, no, no, it doesn't say that. They are not able to kill the soul. Fear not them which are able to kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in the grave, in hell. And so what he's saying is this. Those people may put you to death, and God could obviously stop that, but sometimes he didn't. But they can't take away your hope of resurrection. They can't take away uh, the hope that you have that your life will be given back to you. By the way, you know, when we think of resurrection, we are thinking about the same person being brought back to life. Right? When God speaks to uh, the fathers about, like Abraham, you know, about resurrection, it's Abraham who's going to be raised, and it's Abraham who was given those promises, is going to know God gave me those promises, now they've come true. It's the same person. Otherwise, there's no point in it at all, is there? So, what must happen, and you could think of it, I don't want to trivialize it, but you could think of it like, like a computer, right? Like your memories, you store your photographs on computer. We've got so many photographs on our computers, we run out of space. We don't want to do with them. We don't want to discard any. Don't know which ones the children will want. It says, you know, we've got thousands and thousands of uh, pictures. And now it's going to take thousands of hours to sort them out. I haven't got the time. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? But your life is, as it were, in photographs on a computer. Uh, how long these chips last for, I don't know, but... Uh, probably quite a long time. Some people copy them, and, and in a thousand years, possibly, yeah, they'll still be around. So you can think of it like that, that when we die, our memories, our personality, our character, uh, our experiences are, are stored in, in, in the mind of God, in the great vault of, of life, so that when we are brought back into existence, our person, is brought back into existence. That's not talking about an immortal soul. You don't think, only in science fiction, you think that the computer has got a soul, that the computer is thinking, that, you know, if you put all your photographs in, in a computer, is it conscious? No, it's not. It's just a, a record, just a store, a digital store of our photographs. So you can think of it like that, that God will store our selves, our person, our character, uh, and bring them back into existence. Now, no opposition can destroy that. But we are to fear him that is able to raise us from the dead and to say, no, you're not going to have eternal life. You know, it's, it's a terrible thing to talk about, isn't it? That Jesus would say, who are you? What are you doing there? You're, you're not one of my disciples. But I am. I am. I've given hundreds of talks in your name. What are you doing here? Go back to the world you love too much. That's what it's talking about. It's a terrible thing to think about, but it's a real thing. Right? The, the fear. Fear, he says, fear the one who is able to do that. Fear God. So I don't think it's talking about an immortal soul. It's, I'd say, well, that's a, I don't understand that verse. But the basic truth of these things is absolutely 
straightforward. So, setting aside that it's possible that we reject the gospel, setting that aside and thinking, well, what is the hope of life after death? Well, it's a beautiful hope. It's a hope of being raised from the dead. You and I being raised. We will be the same people. Oh, I don't want to be the same person. Yeah, but we'll be changed. The corruptible will have gone. When Jesus confers immortality uh, and incorruptibility, the bad bits will have gone. And we will be able, we, we won't be distressed, we won't be in pain, we won't be in agony, we won't be in depression, we won't be in anxiety. We will be full of life, energy, and we will be able to serve the Lord Jesus Christ to establish that kingdom on earth, to right the wrongs of this world, to bring justice and peace to the people. That's the hope of life from the dead, because the Lord Jesus Christ is alive, because resurrection is true, because he was raised from the dead and now sits at the right hand of God in heaven, ready to return to set up God's kingdom on this earth. It proves to us that resurrection is real, that God can and will raise the dead, that our sins can and have been forgiven. There's no need for us to fear, to be terrified of facing that long good night. We don't need to rage at the dying of the light. We can actually face it with confidence, not in ourselves, but in the power of of the Lord Jesus Christ that God has given to him to bring us to that kingdom.